evening. Thank you for coming. Uh, you are at the Silicon Valley Bitcoin Meetup. Um, if you are expecting something else, this is what it is. Uh, we've been meeting in this room since September 3rd, 2013. My name is Scott Robinson. I'm the founder of the FinTech practice here at Plug and Play and the co-organizer um, for the last six years up till tonight. Um, so it's with bittersweet news, I'm super excited to announce we'll have a new organizer. So George, my colleague here, um, with the To The Moon shirt. So please round of applause for Joe. <laughs> Three parting things to say. I'm not going anywhere. I'm not like rage quitting crypto or anything like that. Um, <laughs> I'm still hodling. Um, but the reality is, is my life's changed in the past six years. Six years ago, there were 15 people in this room. Bitcoin was worth about $300. Um, I was basically called a joker for two years running. And then the price went up and people started to build. And then all of a sudden, there were these really large banks and investors that were playing around. And last week, our president mentioned Bitcoin. Round of applause for that, because who cares what he said? He said Bitcoin. <laughs> I'm telling you guys, if six years ago in this room, we had told you the president of the United States is going to mention the word Bitcoin, you would be shitting bricks. <laughs> Excuse my French, but really, that was something that was not expected. So. I think that's the one big piece of news in the past six years. There's been a lot of change and a lot of progress. Um, the second piece that I want to part you with is it was really important for me to create an event, like a, an event on a monthly basis where people could be introduced to Bitcoin. And George, of course, encompasses that with integrity. And it was important for me somebody to be transparent in that. So um, you know, George has been running meetups in the past. He's also run a number of startups, um, one being Fresh Pay and a couple others like that. He's been in this space for years. He knows the nuances and the challenges. So in passing the torch, it's important for me to put this in the hands of somebody that understood what they were doing. Um, and the last point I wanted to make is I just wanted to say thank you for coming. Um, I know it's been intermittent, and I apologize for the last few months that I haven't been a good custodian of this meetup, but um, the reality is, is I'm starting a company myself, so time is of the essence. But with that, um, thank you guys for everything. We'll be here once a month for the next six months, and then we'll kind of figure it out from there, but George is your guy, so thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. So it's uh, very cool that Scott was able to pass this off to me. Uh, I promise I won't fuck it up too bad. <laughs> uh, thank you guys for coming. Uh, I really, uh, I'm really, i really happy to see you all. So uh, I've run meetups in the past. Uh, in 2015, I put together what became the biggest uh, human performance meetup and put that in San Francisco. Uh, and that was kind of my hiatus during the crypto winter when uh, I had to sell my Bitcoins in order to make rent. You know, but things are things are different, and I'm really excited about uh, the future of the industry. Uh, and it's it's a very important thing for us to understand why we are building uh, this technology. Uh, it's something that you know we believe can change the world. It already is changing the world, uh, and we want to make sure it, we change it for the better uh, because. Right now, things are not going so well uh, with, with how uh, government intervention, uh, big tech uh, pu putting their greasy paws all over our data. Uh, it's, it's kind of sickening. So uh, I, I actually wanted to put together a privacy uh, theme so that way we could get together and understand, well, you know, what is it that, that Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies have been missing, uh, and what can we do to protect ourselves and protect our data from the grubby hands of those who don't deserve it? Uh, now, I actually put together a uh, a little bit of a talk. This is something that I'm pretty passionate about. Now, I'm going to read off this, so bear with me. Okay. So. When it comes to the history of cash, we've actually already been transacting for hundreds of years anonymously using cash. All right, there are many times, many, many more criminal activity has been used in the past with cash and continues to still be used uh, with the US dollar all over the world. That, that number way outweighs Bitcoin or any other cryptocurrency, even privacy coins. Uh, so cash is the easiest way for criminal activity to happen, regardless of what Trump says uh, in his tweets. But we all know his tweets never make any sense anyway. 
but governments and financial institutions would like to do away with cash because they would like to be able to rely on some form of ledger uh, for how its citizens and residents are continuing to spend because that's an important way to keep control. Uh, but what happens here is that it hurts the consumer's rights uh, to privacy at best, but at worst, it stops legitimate people from being able to transact at all. And I'll tell you how in a bit. If Bitcoin is actually to become money, a digital trustless cash, these are huge concerns that we need to address, and these are centered around privacy. So eliminating cash transactions, uh, as is the trend in some countries, uh, such as uh, the Nordic countries are actually beginning to do this. Uh, only 15% of the country's transactions are, are in green money, and that eventually will be going away. Uh, but when this goes away, it means that anonymous transactions will be a thing of the past. So why is this a problem? Well, here's an example. So cannabis is still illegal federally. Right? Should the feds want to come prosecute California citizens uh, from from buying from dispensaries, they can because well your debit card transaction history is tied to that. Uh, also, the underbanked here in the U.S. are often the poorest among us. Uh, even in this, even in today's society, they have to purchase a reloadable debit card and then pay a transaction fee to load cash onto it. And I don't even know what they would end up doing if they were required to live in a cashless society. I, I can't even fathom what that would look like. Uh, so Andreas Antonopoulos, who, by the way, used to run this very meetup uh, many years ago, tells a story about a young Iranian who came up to him at an event, telling him that he couldn't even get a bank account, uh, even though he has no ties to anything Iran other than the fact that he was born there. And he has a regular job here. Uh, I, I believe he was an engineer. Uh, no ties to terrorist activity. It's just every bank here is Iran, and they won't allow him to open up a bank account. Very odd. Uh, but that's, that's one of the reasons that privacy is important. So a world without cash also means that some party in a financial transaction is, uh, is eventually going to incur a cost uh, or a fee to uh, transmit money to or receive that money. So like uh, if you were to buy something from a, uh, a store using your credit card, well, the, the merchant is paying a fee for that. Uh, if you wanted to pay your friend, well, you know, we can use PayPal for free or Venmo for free, but it's not always free. Uh, it, may, it may not always be free. Uh, so someone will have to pay to send money and another will have to receive, uh, oh, sorry, pay to receive money. Could you imagine what our like global GDP or every transaction that ever occurs uh, would need to pay one to three percent uh, in order to make that transaction happen. That's kind of a scary thing, and and what a waste of money that would end up being. Uh, also, merchant cash flows won't even be able to receive their income for days or weeks, which is the way it is now. But if in a cashless society, they'd be forced to do this, and that means their cash flow is strained, uh, and it's possible that if they do very well on a given day or, or a given season, the bank could even hold on to those funds for risk of, uh, of reversal, of people saying, okay, you know, I, this is not a good, uh, a good product uh, or this is a scam. I, the bank is worried about reversals. So that actually hurts the business. In fact, it happened to mine back in 20, uh, 2008 when my Netflix for Books business got written up in so many uh, magazines and online sources that we killed it with uh, six figures of business uh, in our third month. And that was, uh, that, that was really scary for the bank. They actually shut down our credit card merchant account and withheld our money for a year. So this is the power that banks have over us. Um, now, we know that the Bitcoin blockchain is not anonymous, it is pseudonymous, which means that you have, uh, you have uh, various wallet addresses that are not tied to any identity. But in the real world, it could be tied to an identity. So what would happen if 
I knew your address. Now, why might I know your address? Well, maybe you maybe you paid me five dollars uh, because you wanted uh, you wanted to. Uh, uh, I bought you a beer or something. You're paying me back, right? Well, if I now know your wallet address, and you're not using HD wallets, uh, you're you simply have all of your transactions in that wallet, then you then I know everything that you have done ever since the beginning of that wallet. I can trace those points. And because I have your address, if you still continue to use that address, I can continue to monitor it. Now, if you're a customer of mine, and I'm a shady business person, I might be able to see how much your cash flow is. And because I know your address, uh, simply because we invoiced each other uh, using, using your Bitcoin address, I can now know um, that you can afford me to double or triple my rate. That's, that's awful. Right? We, we shouldn't be able to see into other people's financial situations this way. Uh, also, I used to give away Bitcoin to friends. I don't do that anymore because my friends end up knowing my, my Bitcoin addresses. And that's kind of rough. Bitcoin Jesus would be very upset knowing that I stopped giving away Bitcoin. Uh, so I hope that, by the way, someone is able to figure out a, a better way to give away Bitcoin without it being tied to my own address. But, you know, how would you like it if uh, Starbucks knew your complete financial history every time that you, uh, that you went to buy coffee? Or uh, what if the government, a, a, a municipal government, knew what all of your financial transactions were just because you paid a parking ticket using Bitcoin? You know, imagining that was, that, that was, that was possible. Or a stable coin. Uh, but we all know what happens when the government uh, ends up holding on to some of your private financial data. It, it gets leaked. That's, that's sad. Or uh, here's, a, here's a really bad scenario. What if you ended up paying for, uh, for uh, some street food by a street vendor in Morocco? Well, what happens in Morocco? Well, if you are a wealthy American, uh, there have been many kidnappings that have occurred. So uh, if your public key is compromised simply because you paid some shady street vendor, that, that guy can go call up one of, uh, one of his uh, criminal friends to go kidnap you later on. This is, this is really scary stuff. And it's all because <coughs> Bitcoin is not anonymous. So, uh, however, sometimes this is a good thing, right? Nefarious activity that can occur on the blockchain. Uh, it means that there is a possibility of being able to catch a person in the act. Uh, not, not catch them in the act, but catch them in, in their financial transactions and follow that money trail. Uh, in fact, the FBI loves when Bitcoin is used uh, for nefarious activity. Why? Because they can actually follow that money trail when using cash, they couldn't. Uh, so when a crime occurs, you know, it's, it's bad. Uh, and what we can actually end up doing is blacklisting the coins that were used in that financial transaction or blacklisting a wallet. That could be good, right, for a criminal uh, because then we can shut down their crime activity. But what if it's not a crime? What if it was just an alleged crime and the charges were dropped? Do we, do we now reverse the blacklisting of that, that wallet address? Uh, or uh, what if it was a, from a slanderous, fraudulent claim by a vengeful customer? You know, that causes the merchant an inability to spend other rightfully earned funds out of their wallet. Just like my BookSwim company wasn't able to spend the money that we had rightfully earned, uh, all because it was suspicious and uh, the bank wanted to cover their butts. So blacklisting wallets can be a good thing, but it can also cause more problems, such as leading to a fungibility breakdown. And uh, what is fungibility? Well, fungibility is when a unit of currency is equal in value to all the other units of that same currency. So $1 and $1 can equally be spent. But uh, imagine someone won't take your payment because of a fungibility breakdown where those coins associated with suspicious activity uh, 
were refused. Or imagine that you sell your car to a person who sadly happens to be a thief. Maybe that person is trying to launder uh, his money, but if he paid in cash, there's no issue for you when you deposit that money into the bank account, you being the innocent party. But if it was paid in Bitcoin, with its immutable public history, at some point the feds could track that money back to your address and start scrutinizing you all and all of your other legitimate transactions, and then also rope in your loved ones and start scrutinizing them and their transactions. What if this triggered an IRS audit? Hard. Uh, and it's not just the government and financial institutions that are doing this. So uh, exchanges are banding together to uh, watch for user deposits of coins that are associated with other exchange and custodian hacks because they're protecting their own. That makes sense. And it could be seen as a good thing. But keeping thieves from liquidating their bounty, it becomes a slippery slope without end. So eventually, we may see a dark market for blacklisted coins similar to the dark market for known laundered money and for counterfeit bills. And these are tradable by only a few, but by, by, I'm sorry, these are tradable by a few and valued at a steep discount. So the lack of fungibility could actually break Bitcoin because at any moment, at any moment's notice, our transaction history can become associated with flagged activity. And that can taint the coins that any of us have in our wallet and can taint the coins that we continue to earn. So we want to do good privacy hygiene in today's current uh, blockchain implementation of pseudonymity. So you can be smart. The way you can protect yourself is by using CoinJoin and using mixers to shield your transactions. Right? There's nothing illegal about doing that, except that your history uh, of your transactions are filled with hundreds of 0 .01 BTC from all over the place. That makes you look very, very suspicious when someone looks at those transactions. And you end up being like the creepy guy who's sitting on a subway wearing dark sunglasses and a dark hoodie and a, and, and a, a baseball cap shielding, shielding his face. Uh, but you didn't do anything wrong. You were just maintaining good digital hygiene. So this is why we need privacy by default. Uh, everyone's digital cash transactions should be protected right from the very start and not associated with a name unless that person chooses to publicly display or disclose their transaction and that transaction alone. So this is why I've ga gathered all of you here today uh, because I want to discuss how we can improve Bitcoin and improve other cryptocurrencies with the technology that will make private transactions a reality. So 